Hi, I'm Jesse Dillon, and this is my co-host. Priscilla Cohen, and we're in Jesse's office. Today we're talking to the infamous talent, my friend Bruce Wagner. We'll discuss writing and making movies about the extremities of human behavior. About nuclear families going nuclear, and whether writers can escape their own voices. We'll talk about the luminous Carrie Fisher, the brave Selma Blair, the cool David Cronenberg, and hot Julianne Moore. And that will make sense when you hear Bruce talk about it. But first, subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch this and more episodes, or subscribe to... Jesse's Office, wherever you stream your podcasts. Feel free to leave comments and reviews. I try to respond whenever I can. That you know I was an old hand. We know that you know. We knew you were an old hand. We know that you know about stuff like that. How are you, brother? God, I'm good. Yeah, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. Glad to have you back in the building. Nothing has changed in the building. Not a single thing. Except, uh, (laughs) not a single thing except we're all. Jerry's dead. Yeah, Jerry's dead. There is that. Well, Craig's dead. Jerry's dead. Yeah. Yeah, Jay Maloney's dead. You know, there's who? a lot of Jay, Jay Maloney. Maloney. Yeah, Maloney. But who'd you say before? Craig, Craig, who used to be here. He was partner. Oh. I don't think I don't yeah. know that you knew him. You Is knew he? him. Of course he did. And But when did he die? I, I think I knew about the, that. Back in the slipstream. Yeah, I knew about that, of course. Yeah, but yeah, Jerry yeah. came after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's Jerry's right. Yeah, came poor after. Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. Jesus. How do you guys know each other? <sighs> Just through the time. Like, did you grow up together? Book world or... Maybe. Well, I think we drove an ambulance together. I don't know how we knew how we, I, Now, what is this podcast? How long have you been doing this? Uh, uh, Very a while. recently. Yeah. I mean, or probably a, little a, little while. Little while. a couple of, couple little of little while. Little while. Like, like 10 podcasts ago? Wow. Yeah, we're I mean, doing a bunch. Thought, it's you guys like must a cool be thing. Desperate if you we send are. me an email. Oh, are you kidding? We're excited about you. I'm excited yeah. about you being here yeah. for sure. Well, we're, you're going to help us figure out actually what it's about. Well, you know. I mean, you're a creature of Hollywood. You grew up here. One of few people like me who grew up here. Yeah, yeah. But we haven't started yet. Oh, yeah. We, have. we, no, we started, started when you sat down. <laughs> it's already almost oh. over. We're halfway done. <laughs> okay. That's good because I'm going to excuse myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not a carpet bagger, you know. What I mean? <laughs> but I mean, there must be, there is something magical about this place. You know, it's like you're a novelist and you write about this place. It's like, you know, I, I still have on the wall over there a picture of you with, uh, with uh, you know, um, what's his name? Uh, Be a little more explicit, please. No, you know, the the <laughs> other writer. When we did that thing, I've, it's been on my wall these years. Wait, bottom just, feeders? No, 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 no. Look right there. Behind that thing. Jeremiah, just move that white card right oh. there. Bob Dylan? No. What? Oh, no, right there. Oh, Elroy. Yeah, yeah with yeah, Elroy. Yeah. yeah. But, James you know, Elroy, Elroy writes about a certain kind of place, and yeah. you write about... This place, so yeah. you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot to this. I mean, you think there's something magical about Los, magical about Los Angeles? Well, yes. I mean, there is. Um, in, in, in in shamanistic terms, this person told me that um, that energetically, Los Angeles was very similar to the Valley of Mexico. Right. Um, for me, uh, you know, uh, I. My my father was a, a showbiz bottom feeder, really, and we lived um, south of Wilshire. You know what then became known as the slums of Beverly Hills. You know, I, I was at the Be- the Beverly Hills Hotel, and I ran into uh, one of the realtors on Million Dollar Listing. Right, right, <laughs> and he was asking me about my. My hand tattoo, which is a map of a movie star map from 1931 sure. of Beverly Hills, sure. and uh, I told him that I lived on these streets, Rodeo and Camden, and then uh, he said, "Oh, where?" Um, and I said, "Well, I lived south of the elbow." You know right. what I mean? <laughs> and he said, "Oh, you lived in Baja." <laughs> That's the realtor's term for where I lived, um, but. My father was a, a television producer, um, not really a successful one. And I, early on, um, had a real 
taste, intuitive, and artistic for the extremities of human behavior. You know, so my so, books are about the extremes. They're they're the spiritual and and the pornographic and 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 heinously violent. You know. You know, they they. It seems like at the center of your work is always a a dysfunctional family. You know, it always seems like that's a running theme through your work. There's always some dysfunctional group of people who are trying to mm. communicate and having difficulty. You know, um, yeah. Uh, does that seem right? Yeah, I I mean, I I don't know. You know, there there are many themes that are um, consistent in my work. One of them is madness. You know? Right. Um, characters losing their minds through um, a repetitive failure, uh, an embarrassment of failure, uh, or through drugs. Right. Or uh, inherited psychosis. Um, another stalwart um, part of my work are damaged children, you know? Right. Children who are either um, have a fatal illness, um, an exotic illness, uh, children that are, are sexually molested and um, are dying in a sense from the the nexus of that event right. so you could say that drama one there is no real drama of, about families that are um all that are all right, right. you know yeah. what i mean but uh i think as a, a germ in my work it's often my work often includes a nuclear family that is gone nuclear you know um let's just look at this for a second i just want to get your opinion on this you remember this, of course. <laughs> that's oh. from that's from Caddyshack. No? Yeah, that's from Caddyshack. Actually, yeah. Bill hold Murray on, was she... amazing. Oh, hold on, here she is. She strikes me as a very this strikes me as a very Bruce moment. I haven't. Would you mind if I say a few words? Thank you. I just want to tell you all how happy I am to be back in the studio, making a picture again. You don't know how much I've missed all of you. And I promise you I'll never desert you again. Because after Salome, we'll make another picture and another picture. You see, this is my life. It always will be. There's nothing else. Just us. And the cameras. And those wonderful people out there in the dark. <laughs> all right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. Uh. <laughs> I mean, she she really reminds me of a very Bruce Wagner type character, uh, you know. She, you know I, I always think of Catherine O'Hara now doing an SCTV <laughs> yeah. parody yeah. of her. Yeah, I mean that never gets old for me. Yeah, um, yeah. That that film never gets old. It's, how, how is that? Hollywood, like, what is that? What, how does that? Because it's been going on since right. then. Yeah. Well, I mean, this this movie, the idea of um, of of aging out, yeah, and uh, losing one's footing, and and then the delusions that are required uh, to reinvent or rebuild one's facade, you know. Um, is something that that I think all of us can relate to. I mean, now particularly, you have um, Instagram famous people that suddenly um, are, are brutally injured because they fall from a great <laughs> height, or um, they metaphorically no one's interested in in them because they make the wrong comment yeah. right. or um, or get too too. I mean, avaricious, you know, it's... Is that a Hollywood thing? Is that a California no, thing? No, but you, you, in specifically in terms of, of Sunset Boulevard, this notion um, of, of embarrassment and shame uh, where one is, has lost one's relevance or popularity, I think, is, is something that is heightened 
in Hollywood because Hollywood has such a bright light shown on that. Right. Um, but it's it's a very human uh, nightmare, you know, to no longer be relevant. Um, you know, one of the, the things that is absolutely riveting to me is Selma Blair's courageous mm. Mm. Instagram um, yeah, on MS. Uh, yeah. account where she yeah. announced to the world that she had MS yeah. mm-hmm. and drew, draws you in to the daily um, drama, uh, sometimes, uh, often in a very lighthearted way. Right. But this, this transformation from someone that was regarded as untouchable, uh, as we all regard ourselves as untouchable, this could not happen to us. This could not happen or be happening to Selma. Uh, is so captivating, and and there's a metaphor there, the fall, you know, from the the elegant uh, um, movie star who was uh, so blessed in terms of her beauty that she was working with Karl Lagerfeld and uh, not a not a not a huge movie star, but respectable and loved, Mm -hmm. that this should be happening. Uh, to her uh, makes her a kind of sacrificial animal in a way. And uh, that is absolute uh, drama to me yeah. and, and, um, and, and captivating. And it encapsulates a lot of w- what we were just talking about, this fall, you know, and, and how does one, certainly Selma is not delusional. She's the opposite of that. Yeah. She's, um, she's, Candid, her candor is heroic, and uh, and does inspire people as it should. You know, um, so that's looking back. That's peering way into the past. When you look at something like this, on one too. Yeah. Not pregnant. Not pregnant. Oh God. You know, this is the Kardashians. Yeah, and there's Kanye. Also, you know, it's a whole different now. She's got a different nose. That's old. But it's but I mean, he's like a genius. You know, it's like yeah. You you can't in terms of the the mandala of the Kardashians. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to to best it. Right. It's impossible to come up with something more brilliant in a fictive way. Right. Um, you have Kanye, who is, I, I agree with you, I, I really adore him. Right. And, and his, the bipolar aspect. Yeah. Which is annoying AF. Right. But is also part of the mandala. Yeah. And then, I mean, we can't forget um, Caitlyn Jenner, oh, I God, mean, right. and when when that happened, it, it, the impact almost the, on the culture was it was a shock wave, you right. know, yeah. and and so bold. Uh, so the 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 Kardashians, you know, have hatched all these new children. I mean, it's just uh, <laughs> it, as long as it it's a, a, a reality show for me that um, that's. It's a novel that I, I want to read again. And I mean, forget um, Carl Ove, you know what I mean? Uh, the Kardashians to me have it all. Right. And, uh, you know, so I'm impressed <laughs> you to know, death yeah. with, with them. You I know? mean, you know, it's like, does Trump push them yeah. to the side? Or is or Trump they... a result of, is he president because of, did they pave the way? Well, I don't think they paved the way. Well, I don't know. No, he's, he's part of their show. Yeah, they're not part of his show. Yeah, um, uh, these extremes. Have you always been sort of attracted to the extremes of these behaviors? Yeah, in, 
for me, you know, I, I think my, my work has been misread or misunderstood often because what we seize on is not the epiphany and not the spiritual mm-hmm. or the transcendent. What we wallow in is the, the darkness and the, the muddy darkness and, and the malignancy mm-hmm. uh, um, of, of sides of human behavior. For me, I, I would rather um, die than only portray the malevolent uh, side of what we as human beings are capable of. There's no, if there's no redemption, no transcendence, um, then I, I I would take a pass, but I think often my work is is um, summarized as um, the bleakest uh, parts of of uh, of Hollywood and of human nature, you know. But I don't see it that way at all. I never start a book without knowing that there will be transcendence, that there will be a journey that will be transcendent. So a book like Memorial, like how does that start? You know, how to, what's the first line of the first page before there's anything? You know, it's the same process for me. I'm like a stroke victim right. who uh, is slowly working his way back in rehab right. to that day when I leave the hospital. And leaving the hospital is that day that I actually begin a book. Right. And every time I forget how to write a book, yeah. I... I look at the books in front of me like an uncle wrote them and sent them to me. Right. And, and I'm saying, how the f*** did my uncle do right. this? I could <laughs> right. never do this. <laughs> right. And then slowly some themes emerge that are right. so compelling to me that uh, there's something so beautiful um, in the resolution of these themes that I, I am then forced to begin the book. So what would be a theme that would attract you? Just Just in a broad stroke, like when you say a theme, it's like, you know, oh, I want to deal with violence in this book. I want to deal with, you know, a heartache. I want to deal with regret. I want to, you know, what, how do you, what's a theme? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm attracted to the perversions, um, that wealth, um, brings. Right. Uh, and I'm also, um, attracted to um, personalities that are sociopathic. Right. You know. Now, have you met a lot of people like that? I mean, I, but beyond the normal people we run into in Hollywood, like yeah. where you really know they're sociopathic? You don't um, really, if you're fortunate, you don't get to know someone like mm-hmm. that because often the, there's devastation behind mm-hmm. that. But I'm, I'm really attracted to transformation. For example, um, I was watching a uh, reality a documentary um, about children who were convicted of violent crimes and given life sentences without the possibility of parole. Right. Uh, th- these were pre-2012 because in 2012 the Supreme Court ruled that um, that is a violation of the Eighth Amendment. You can't do that. Right. So um, this documentary um, was a, uh, a, a white couple, uh, well off, right. who were um, shot in their bedroom. And the, the woman died, her husband survived. And it's, it came out that their daughter was in love with a 15-year-old. Daughter right. was also 15, Mexican boy. And the parents did not approve of that, did not want her to see him, etc. In this documentary, the girl uh, allegedly asks her boyfriend to kill them, kill her parents. He doesn't want to do that, he said. And then the girl um, concocts a story that she was is being molested by the father. So manipulates him into actually doing the deed. Right. They're both arrested. And now their case is being looked at again. They're in their early 40s now. And they're both in prisons that are not far from each other. At the time of their... Um, 
uh, imprisonment at 15, the father was so angry at what his daughter had wrought that he absolutely lobbied for both of them to go to prison and get life without possibility of parole. Right. He, they said he stopped going to church. He went into a spiral of depression, very dark. The documentary reveals that he has gone to visit his daughter and reestablished a relationship with her, went to visit the the boyfriend, which, of course, they're not in any kind of relationship anymore, and al- allowed the, the the 15-year-old boy, now 42, to begin to forgive himself. Right. And But this is the stunning novelistic part of the story. The father said, now he's at the end of his life, that his fantasy is that both are freed from prison. He goes and picks up the boy now a man first, and they spend a delightful 90 minutes traveling to the other prison to pick his daughter up, and then they come and live with him. Wait, that's his fantasy? That's his fantasy. This right. will never happen. Right. right. Because Texas, being Texas, said, yeah. all of y'all, right. it's too late. You fi- It had to be a year after the Supreme Court decision, an impossible thing, right. Right. but that's Texas. and But the fantasy of it, you know, um, mm. is something that was so Baroque and poignant to me. Um, you know, it, it was I used a, a plane crash in one of my books. I think it was still holding. And I based it on a, something which was real. Um, it was a, um, a plane that was coming from Puerto Vallarta. And if you read the details of the crash, when the pilots called the, the air control tower in San Francisco, they got a pilot over to the air control tower to listen to what the pilot was saying was wrong with the plane. Right. Once they made it clear, the pilot knew that there was no way they could fix this. Right. And that the plane was doomed. Right. All he said was, I'll see you in San Francisco. Yeah. So you've got the pilots having a little bit of hope Mm. and telling Mm. the passengers, let's say, Mm -hmm. we're having some trouble. So you have these 350 souls, yeah, yeah, uh, truly like um, a lost ship, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. the Flying Dutchman. Their intent is that they're going to land, yeah, and they're thinking of their loved ones, yeah. yeah. It's so m- mythical to me and so powerful. Yeah. So these themes come, but they have to be really significant, Jesse, in order for me to decide I'm going to drape a novel. You know, mm, you know, you know. Uh, it's good to hear that thing about the plane I'm flying in. A little I know. I was just today, thinking so. about that. <laughs> just thinking but um, uh, you've had fellow travelers. You know, Buck Henry, Carrie Fisher. We're looking at uh, the the um, James you know Elroy. Uh, James Elroy up there. You know, what is it that that makes a fellow traveler? I know you were very close with Carrie. Like, what would you know? It's, you know, she was a satirist in a certain sense of the yeah. word. Did you? I mean, not even in your work, you know, because you, you obviously loved her. Was there a um, was there a view on on the world that comes through? No, she's a special, special case. Right. I mean, she was. Uh, there's a group of us that are still, you know, we'll be forever grieving our own flying Dutchman, our mm-hmm. own lost plane. Right. Um, Carrie having essentially died on a plane. Right. Yeah. And I, I don't. There's not a, a plane ride I go on that I don't think of of my dear sister. Um, and she was a luminous creature. You know? mm-hmm. I mean, I remember seeing Buck. Um, he was so angry um, right. at God. It was so touching for me to behold, you know. He was he was violently quaking, right. angry that, that, that this soul should have, have been allowed to be released. Um, so what was the magic of her? You know, beyond, you know, we all know her as a Star Wars star and movies she made, but she was a great writer and she was, uh, the few times I was with her, she was always just sort of a magical person in a way. Yeah, truly. I mean, impossible to convey. Um, but you know, uh, everyone that had close encounters with her, I mean, uh, more than glancing, were she was like a perfume, and it it, <laughs> it was the scent was different on everyone, you know. So she 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 was a, a, a genius, Carrie, 
not only a, a um, cerebral, but uh, soulful. And um, you know, and, usually with people like that, there's a because they're so good at what they do. There's a there's a kindness. Is there a deep kindness? Oh, generosity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolute generosity. So, you know, but I, I, you know, I don't talk. This is the first time I've ever talked about her. Um, people are always asking me and so many others, and it's something that uh, is repugnant to me, you know. Um, but you're an old friend. And, of course. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there will never be the likes of her uh, again. It's that the ultimate cliche, you know, which, which uh, I don't even like to hear that cliche, but mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, the, it's what comes to mind with her, you know. I have a question because themes, you say themes, but then your characters are so vivid. So are the characters coming from these people in your life as well? No, not at all. Do you do you know them? You know, uh, Dickens used to say that he knew his characters. Oh, absolutely. You know. But yeah. you, they, they, you know, they do, come in from, so how, where do they come from? Well, I mean, that's uh, an unknown, yes. you know, but, but the beautiful thing about when, when, when you write a book, when I write a book, there comes that wonderful moment when um, the the character is writing you, you're no longer writing mm -hmm. the character, and it's a liberation because it's burdensome when you're you're carving and uh, uh, you're anguishing over a character, and and then one day it takes hold of you, and that's a that's a, a lovely moment for me because uh, um, I don't know then where I'm going. Do they hang around these characters after the book is gone? No, mm -mm. I, I think it's probably like an actor doing a movie or something, you know. Um, I, when did you meet David Cronenberg, and and was it? Did you obviously he's one of our great auteur directors, maybe one of the very few that are left. I mean, there's Quentin Tarantino and a few others, but yeah. there's not many. Yeah. Um, do you remember when you met him? And yeah. What, and and what was? Did you? immediately recognize a kindred soul? Well, uh, I, I loved his movies so much. And um, we had the same agent at a certain point, John Burnham. Right. And I knew Burnham from high school, you know. Uh, and he, I think, had mentioned to me that, that David liked my work. You know, mm -hmm. David's very literary, uh, as famously said or infamously, that he was more influenced by books than, than film. Sure. So... I um, I wanted to do something with David, you know, and there was a section of the first book I wrote, Force Majeure, called Wild Psalms, and it was about a Holocaust survivor impersonator, <laughs> you know, and so I flew to Toronto to meet with David, and uh, like you were going to adapt just that piece. Yeah, I was thinking of that, you know, but yeah. it was really an entree. It was a reason to go and right. see David, and uh, and then we we. There was a kinship. There's a a, a very something. Was it, was it instant though? You know, there's very yeah. yeah there's yeah, very yeah. few. There's very yeah. few of these kinds of people around. You know, these kind of unusual yeah. characters. Yeah, so, he was. You know, do you walk in and sit down and know that this is like something special? Instant Jewish daddy, Jewish brother. <laughs> right. You know, Jewish husband. Yeah. I mean, you know, instant. Yeah. And um, our there's many similarities in our work. You know, the, our preoccupations. And I think I had written Maps to the Stars um, and and showed it to him. Not, at, I, I wasn't uh, so presumptuous as to say, maybe you could sh do this. Shoot you know this I mean? thing yeah. up. You know? Yeah, <laughs> and because it was so odd, the piece, that I think I was a little gun shy. But I showed it to him the way I would show him a novel or a novella. And... He uh, he didn't say much about it, but he mm -hmm. he somehow it, it, it lodged in his head, mm -hmm. and maybe ten years later he said, um, "I'd like to do this," you and know, then it um, fell apart, and yeah. then it was another eight years or something like that. You know, when you give a movie like that to an artist like that, mm. you know, your what's your role on the set? Because he's not he's not going to change your words. So what's his What's his? What's he counting on you for during the process of making the movie? Well, um, you know, I was just—it was such a privilege for me to hang out 
mm-hmm. on that set, you know. But are you just hanging out, or is he asking you questions? Well, you know, I remember there was a time the script supervisor um, would, uh, the script supervisor would literally go up to him and say, this actor or actress said the, and there's no the in the script. Right. <laughs> do you want her to do it again, or are you okay with it? Sometimes he would say, do it again. Right. And it was a, a certain point where I asked the script, script supervisor, because um, I had some nervousness on the set. Uh, I said, what are, what are you doing next? And he said, very Canadian, but very earnest, he said, it's what are we doing next? You mm. know, right. You're part of this. Right. Mm. And that was a... a a, a lovely moment for me. But David would ask me um, th- certain things. I mean, he knew exactly what he was doing, so it was never but, like... But would he say, like, well, you know, what was your guy thinking about in this moment? No, 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 no. no. So it would be like, I mean, what would it be like, well, how big do you think the house is? Or No, no, it would be more um, like he, he there would be continuity issues in terms of the script, something right. that suddenly for him didn't make sense. Right. And I would either agree or disagree. Right. Uh, most of the time agree because he's been doing this for so long. Or um, I would say, you know, um, Scientology is um, going through a, a controversial period. So this line where uh, Robert Pattinson says... He's thinking of becoming a Scientologist as a career move. Mm-hmm. Does that no longer make sense? Right. We would discuss that. You know, so it was things like that. But for the most part, I was along for the ride. I mean, I, just a front row seat and, and loving it. And know? and what did you see there? Because, you know, you've been on a lot of sets, so this is somebody different. And, you know, I've, I've been on sets and seen really amazing directors make great choices, and you know there's something different when you're sitting with them. Were, did you... Did you feel something different about how he thought about about making a movie because he's made so many? Well, David um, is very cool. You know, Julianne Moore said this. There's, you know, my is hot, <laughs> and David's stuff is very cool. Yeah. So th- that synthesis um, was good for me to watch. In other words, he would make decisions. You know, my impulse is always to go toward the, the Grand Guignol and the Baroque, although there was plenty of Grand Guignol in, in Maps to the Stars. But David was extremely, um, almost poetically scientific about what he was doing and absolutely fearless, you know. Um, how, how, how fearless? What do you mean fearless? <clears throat> well, uh, the, the material that in Maps to the Stars was confounding to critics at times because it was, um, they couldn't understand the, the, that there could be the, a nuance, that there could be a collision of genres such as something that is dreamlike, which I thought the whole movie was a fever dream, and yet satirical. You know, so critics like to say, well, what is it? Is it one or is it the other? Yeah. You know, right. is it Children of Paradise or is it the player? You right. know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it, was, it was a Cronin Burgundian, as we yeah. put it, um, um, melange, you know. So David was fearless in that sense, does not, absolutely does not give a about um, anyone's interpretation mm-hmm. or critique. Uh, and has a very, very clear, uh, almost rapacious vision of what this film mm. or whatever film he's working on should look like. You know, you know how, how much do you, when you're sitting and writing a book, how much do you, do you think back on other books by other writers? Are there writers that do you go like, uh, okay, I'm going to look at Dostoevsky or I'm going to look at Gogol or, you know, <laughs> like is there, are there writers that are, or no. breadcrumbs for you? No, you know, I think when I was 15, I read a quote from Norman Mailer, and um, it stuck in my head all yeah. these years, you know, 50 years later. He said, when you're working on a book, it's like you're, you've are you got your car up um, in a rack, mm-hmm. and, and the engine's out, and you're just covered in grease. You don't want to look up and see a Ferrari. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Zoom past. Right. You know? So you, you stay away. I stay away. Mm. from any of those 
um, writers that are so close to my heart because for better or for worse, whatever book I'm writing is going to be a book by Bruce Wagner. I can't escape that. I have tried to escape it, you know? I have tried to escape it. You know, um, uh, California, it's such an unusual place. You know, and, and all writers, you know, in poetry, you know, you think about great poets, it's like they they always own a place. You know, they, they always, you know, it's like you're not going to read Dante and he's going to be, you know, talking about being in France. You know, he's talking about what he where he grew up. Is is the influence of California just an, a, a hidden character in all of your work? I, you know, I, I honestly don't know. I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm a California boy through and through. You right. know, um, I'm obsessed with the Beach Boys, m- the mysticism and 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 purity of the Beach Boys obsessed with the iconography of surfing, although I I don't go in the ocean, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, um, uh, enthralled with the astrological chart, you know, Um, and yet there is that aspect of me that has an interest uh, in the murderous and the transcendent, you know, and, and that end of the world aspect of California and that sunlit aspect. You know, I think of Ed Ruscha so much because he embodies for me so much of, of California and Los Angeles. And I would like to say that I have been influenced by California as he has. Mm-hmm. It's uh, what is it exactly? Um, there's something mystical, something very simple with clean lines, mm-hmm. something with a, a light that is as magical and indescribable, let's say, as Carrie Fisher. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, the, the, the idea of the movie industry, which is for me operatic mm-hmm. and an absolute laboratory for, um, for transcendence and death. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's not just what the movies portray. That is... The people that are the the pyramid, the people that built the pyramid of the movies, you know, and perished during that time, either naturally or unnaturally. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Do you do you when you say murderous? How do you study that? How do you learn about the things that you might write about about sick children or dark things that have occurred? Well, you know, I think y- y- you have you're born with a predilection, you know. Um, like for example, I, I was um, reading um, Dennis Johnson the other day, Jesus' son, mm-hmm. and I came to that quite late. And at the end of that book, there is a story about a hospital, well, hospital ward, <clears throat> a convalescent um, hospital that had all kinds of people in it, not just old people. When I drove an ambulance, I was in one of those places. It was a convalescent hospital that had um, uh, children in it who had oversized heads, hydroencephalitis. It had accident victims, people in their 30s who were quadriplegic. It was a, a ward, uh, you know, a, a, of, of anomalous types because we consider a convalescent home to be a very tidy, uh, there's a tidy definition. It's mm-hmm. where people who... who our aging go to to sure. live their lives out in hopefully some kind of peace. So there, here's something in a bedlam, in essence, you know. Um, uh, so I, I I came to that because it attracts, it attracted me. It wasn't that I then became attracted to it. It found me. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? I didn't find it. And and this idea um, of my preoccupation with with um, with violence, or um, or the horror of um, of of human beings and their phobias, their fears, their um, claustrophobic nature, their their um, people that are that are af- afraid of heights, open spaces, flying. All of these things are things that I had to confront in myself. Right. Because I was neurotic to the core. Mm. You so, were? Are you still? <clears throat> I don't think so. Mm. I don't think so. I mean, um, 
the the artist's prerogative. I, I have my bad days. But I think, and it's not that I purged those fears, but I certainly confronted them in my fiction. Mm-hmm. And that was very, that was a very powerful fuel for me. I, I confronted my anger. You know, there's this lovely quote um, uh, from um, Christopher Hitchens where uh, they asked him about his anger. He said, yeah, he wakes up angry, and it really is helpful for his work. I think I wrote for many years um, in a rage, you know, and I still do. I still do. There's so many things that enrage me, you know. Um, Back to Selma Blair, Mm -hmm. um, I think she had... Her hair in, in in braids, and someone accused her of appropriation. Mm, I mean, mm-hmm. things things on these micro yeah, scales yeah. have the the. I tend to satirically make them much larger, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, uh, as a way of almost doing chemo on that horrific aspect, that cancer that that grows in our society, where um, fingers are pointed. Uh, for nonsensical reasons, um, but these things um, lead often to to very dark places. Does it? You know, I always thought of the years that we've known you. You would always talk about that dark, the human nature, the vicious attacks, and now with really the onslaught of social media, we see all of that come out mm. more. Is do you think there's just more opportunity or? It's just the way many people are. Yeah, like, are we- I, I don't see, um, I don't have a nostalgia for a time that was kinder and gentler. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't, well, there wasn't really a time. Yeah, that's, that what, I meant. Yeah. that's yeah. what I meant. That's what I meant. I don't, um, you know, you, 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 there was the woman recently that carved a baby out of a, yeah. a, a woman. Oh, yeah. Right. And now that the baby is dead, yeah. the woman died. Yeah. So you could say, well, Sharon Tate lived in kinder, yeah. gentler times. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because they didn't yeah. carve the baby out of her, but it would be farcical. Do you know right. what I mean? Right. Um, there is an aspect of of the darkness of humanity. As I said, it is essential that that aspect is balanced mm-hmm. um, with the absolute truism that there is an an an, an element of us that is sacred. And and tender, and um, and and glorious, you know. You know, is it the the opposite of these extremes that attracts you? The the angelic being and the the darkest being, and how those coexist between people? Yeah, I would say absolutely, absolutely. You yeah. know, and and what is what is the Kardashians or the world of Kardashians? Is that just backdrop? You know, uh, I, 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 I can't, um, I won't even venture to deconstruct the, the Kardashians, you know, the mandala of the Kardashians. It's complicated, right? Well, yeah. yeah. It's a super, like everybody's super dismissive of it, but it's a... Well, well not everybody's yeah, super dismissive. I right? think it, 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 at one time um, it, it was uh, more common to, to say... What are they famous for? You know, which yeah. I think is is so simplistic at this point. Right. You know what I mean? Um, you know, uh, those uh, the bathroom. You know, with the flat sink. Yeah. I just I, I <laughs> love that. Dish, you know what I mean? And and he, you know, I, I watched his interview with uh, with Letterman. Oh, you mean Kanye? Kanye, Kanye yeah. 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 Um, he, he, you know, I I, I really do have a. a, a an emotional attachment to his music. Yeah. Right. You know I mean? Yeah. And then you you hear these old these rockers, you know, say, yeah. "Oh, I, I I don't get it." You know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, because they're not listening. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. his love of language. Yeah. And sure. he He's, has that sacred yeah. and profane yeah, aspect to him, sure. which is so attractive to yeah. me. You yeah. know? Were you were you shocked when you know the downfall? Although he hasn't really fallen, really. Harvey Weinstein and the entire kind of disintegration or the ma- things coming around with with everything that happened in Hollywood recently, and then it accelerates well, out. No, I wasn't shocked. It's it, it's interesting to me um, that that a 
a wave, a tsunami came and and destroyed uh, an entire coast, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting because you never expect that. You you don't know um, something like that's coming. But you're in Hollywood your whole life, yeah. and certainly we all. I mean, we all heard these stories. We, I mean, people knew this was going on. Did you ever to expect it to be? It's sort of and it's, always it's, being discovered in different ways. Right. I mean, you think about but, you know Eddie Fisher and you know you know all the things he went through. I mean, like you just can go back to these sort of. There's always these rituals of uh, humiliation and right, but to this know. level, I well, mean, I don't know. You know, it, where's Kevin Spacey today, for example? Yeah, well, uh, I I He's think he'll be back. Show on I think he'll be. You know I think I mean? he'll be back. Yeah, yeah. But um, with Weinstein, you know, it, it, unless you were really in the trenches, I mean, I I you know, I have my thoughts about Harvey Weinstein, but the. the that came out, certainly not, you know, right. I had no right. awareness of right. that. Right. And, um, you know, I had heard one actress that I know said that um, he, he, she had been asked to his hotel, but she's a tough cookie. And she told me that years ago and I, I right. it wasn't, right. it right. didn't register. But, you know, um, let's, but, let's watch this one last clip because oh, it may have, okay. may have some, may provide some things. This I, is Jack Nicholson getting the yeah, Cecil B. DeMille. Award, oh, wow. right? But it, it, but I, I saw this clip and I thought of you because oh. he does this one thing that reminds me of you. Uh, I've come to the Golden Globes forever before I was invited, before, <laughs> before it was on television, and you know, but before television, it was wild. I saw Joan Crawford, you know, the, the legend, the idol of my own mothers and sisters. World War II for chic and a strong woman, probably already the chairman of the CEO of Pepsi-Cola, stand up here and go, in my day, we had them. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I saw Rita Hayworth come sauntering down the center stage to some stripper music, you know, turn her back. <laughs> back over her back, I'll tell you. What a sight. I almost wept. <laughs> you know, in a certain sense, isn't that you watching all these people? No, this? no, I'll tell no? you what's me okay. when I watch this. Um, in my head, I see Sean Connery pursued on the street, now in his 80s, enfeebled. Um, was that Warren Beatty? I yeah, yeah that was Warren Yeah. Yeah making that embarrassing flub, yeah. appearing geriatric. Oh, yeah. And, and then the last movie, not making much of, a, of, of an impression. Right. And the, the fade out, Nicholson, I, cantankerous, uh, front row, still the Lakers, how much longer? Yeah. I see, in other words, the Olympian gods mm -hmm. who f for in almost... Um, uh, uh, an amount of time that cannot be quantified are famous and and wealthy and and powerful. I remember barely, but watching something like this, and it's so present. And now it's new. It's it, it will become a newsreel, yeah, and so, everyone will be dead. So it, it, so is that about impermanence? Yeah. Yeah, in other words, the the you know um, everything is free. everything is a is 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 a dream right. is a dream. So this is the 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 trick of this life, is you you love and you care deeply, uh, and yet it's a dream <laughs> that that you will awaken from um, into another dream, uh, and and so. All of the 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 anguish, the absolute misery, the depths of horror that that we feel, um, you know, the the uh, is uh, is a, a famous Buddhist quote, like the death of a child in a dream. Do you know what I mean? Right. So one one has to somehow keep one's sanity by uh, the, with humility. You know, I'm, I look at that and I don't, I don't say, oh, these foolish people. No, I, I, you know, I love Nicholson in my day as much as, as everyone did. Um, and so it's not that. But you have to have the, the humility 
when you're writing about uh, impermanence, um, that fame is, is attractive. Uh, you know, there, there was a, a story that I've often quoted where um, a, a, there was a, a Buddhist monk that wanted to be the most famous recluse, you know. Right. That was his aspiration. And, and I, I, uh, it has been written in Buddhist texts that the desire for fame and approbation is the most difficult thing to shake. It's harder than the desire for riches, for revenge. It, it, it's the last one to go. Do right. you know what I mean? Right. And, and so we have to realize that in the dream, the, that's why it so attracts me, the, 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 this dream of Hollywood, this dream, this impermanence, uh, uh, this impermanent notion of fame. You know, it, 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 it captures me, you know. That's why the, the Selma Blair thing is, is so uh, staggeringly moving and, um, and lovely in its way to me, you know. No, no morbidity about it at all, nothing yeah. morbid about it at all. Yeah. It's the truth, you know. Yeah. Bruce, thank you so much thank for coming you, in and Bruce. doing this. It was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's yeah, yeah. lovely. Yeah. Fun. Good. That was great. <laughs> Thanks for watching or listening. Don't forget to subscribe. Click here for the here. next episode. Here.